as the founding director of the Carl Spain Center on Race Studies and Spiritual Action, I consider it a special honor to share this momentous occasion with the daughter of Dr. Carl Spain, Claudette, and with his grandson, Gavin. With the blazing zeal of the prophet Amos, Dr. Spain's prophetic words left a major crack in the foundation of the false religion of white supremacy that piously prevailed in Churches of Christ in the 1960s. In his 1960 lecture, behind this podium, Dr. Spain courageously exposed the contradiction of Christians having their membership in the Churches of Christ while they maintain their membership in what he called the royal order of the master race. Dr. Spain believed that preaching Christian values to the communist world, while at the same time advancing the antichrist values of Nazism and white supremacy, was a glaring contradiction. Such a hypocritical contradiction stood out in the spotlight on the world stage and could not be kept hidden even off stage from the communists who clearly observed it from behind the Iron Curtain. It is an honor today to stand behind this same podium from which Dr. Spain stood as he spoke a timely truth on February 24, 1960 about the sin of racism that permeated Churches of Christ and their related schools and colleges. Dr. Spain's 1960 lectureship address was entitled, Modern Challenges to Christian Morals. His powerful address is as relevant today as it was over a half a century ago. Standing behind this podium, 58 years ago was no easy place to take a stand. And neither is it an easy place to stand today in the midst of a major social climate change that is melting the already thinly iced over race relations in America. Spain made the bold claim in his 1960 address that white supremacy was the most credible threat in America to the Christian morals that were being fervently preached from Christian pulpits of every major religious body across this country. While white American Christianity vehemently condemned Soviet communism for being atheistic and anti-democratic, Spain rightly pointed out that these same Christians were hypocritically excluding, denying, and obstructing African Americans from having full participation in the highly esteemed system of American democracy. I therefore stand today behind the same podium 58 years later to declare that the doctrine of white supremacy still continues to remain a credible threat in America to Christian morals. To give loyal allegiance to white supremacy is the equivalency to denouncing total allegiance to Christ supremacy. Both supremacies cannot rule, reign, nor cohabitate in the house of prayer for all nations. Needless to say that Spain's fearless rebuke attracted to his prophetic back the stinging whip of public punishment and the cruel form of social rejection, religious ostracism, tribal rage, and racial retribution. 
A former Spain student puts it this way, this act of valor virtually ruined Spain's preaching career. Churches canceled meetings he was scheduled to preach. Anonymous letters and phone calls made threats on Spain's life. His own brothers in Christ made his life a nightmare. The student went on to say that the Carl Spain I had in class was a pleasant, godly man. Only later did I learn of his courageous words and the high cost he paid for delivering them. The Carl Spain Center on Race Studies and Spiritual Action was created to serve as a reminder of the significant difference one courageous life could make in an imbalanced world filled with raw injustice and racial discrimination. Some buildings are named in honor of those who have given great sums of money, but the Spain Center is named in honor of one who gave his life as a courageous living monument that stands tall in the tradition of the Old Testament prophets. Hopefully, monumental prophetic, his monumental prophetic contribution will inspire countless future generations of Christians to live in the Christ-centered spiritual resistance to political, religious, and economic systems that promise to bless them with all of mammon's global glory if they would only bow down in obedient worship to them. Dr. Spain made the following statement in his lecture that revealed his full knowledge of the influential role that money often plays in the private preservation and sustained maintenance of white supremacy. He also knew that this relationship between money and white supremacy often took place under the clever disguise of Christian education. In his lecture, Spain said, God forbid that churches of Christ and schools operated by Christians shall be the last stronghold of refuge for socially sick people who have Nazi illusions about a master race. Spain went on to ask the 1960 Abilene Christian College lectureship audience, are we moral cowards on this issue? There are people with money who will back us in our last ditch stand for white supremacy in a world of pigmented people. God forbid that we shall be the last stronghold among religious schools where the political economic philosophy of naturalism determines our moral char character. He said the surest way to seal the doom of this nation is for the only Christians to be the only ones with unchristian attitudes. We pray that students and all people that experience the influence of the Carl Spain Center on Race Studies and Spiritual Action will choose to emulate the moral courage of Carl Spain. The days that we live in are filled with serious challenges that will demand serious courage. The writer in Ephesians 5 says that the days are evil. Carl Spain's speech reminds us, as our text reminds us today, that the best remedy for the evil days will be people that are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not produce fear and hate, but it produces courage and love and soundness of mind. It will take being filled with the Holy Spirit to protect our hearts against what Paul describes in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4 as being the intoxicating influence of seducing spirits. Robert Greene's book called The Art of Seduction is one of the best-selling books of our time. Robert Greene provides leaders from politics to religion with practical strategies on how to subjugate entire nations through political and religious 
seduction. The seducing spirit of Antichrist is why Paul calls for us to be awake and to be wise and to be prudent in the evil days. The days are evil and we have no time to be drunk, drowsy, and inebriated. Because the days are evil, we must not take into our systems misinformation that can impair our judgment in regards to what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is evil. The writer of Ephesians says that the evil days infect even the soundness of speech. Verbal expressions in the evil days reveal a serious corruption of human intelligence. Ephesians 5 describes words spoken in the evil days as being callous, indecent, vulgar, inappropriate, insulting to others. The corruption of language in the evil days during our time has led to political polarization and racial division. America's external enemies are waiting to witness the internal implosion of America's racially divided house. Jesus says that Satan is the ultimate seducer. Lying is the seducer's native language. Lucifer, the seducer, uses language and words to confuse the unwise, making them confuse evil for good and good for evil. As Dr. Spain said in his lecture, we see evil as good when it accomplishes our goals, and we see good as evil when it obstructs our path to power. In this critical hour, the church cannot afford to be seduced into a satanic state of confusing evil for good and good for evil. The church must break free from the hypnotic spell of the seducer so that the church can properly discern between what is just and what is unjust so that the church can speak courageously on behalf of those who are treated with disrespect and indignity. During this current hour of great division and national unrest, the world despises the loud noise of the church's silence and the ugly face of evil. When senseless shootings happen, like the recent one in Dallas that took the life of our dearly beloved brother in Christ, Botham John, we as Christians must not remain silent and confuse evil for good and good for evil. When the city of Flint, Michigan has all its residents exposed to poison drinking water, it is no time for Christians to remain silent and confuse good for evil and evil for good. When neo-Nazis and white nationalists gather in Charlottesville or anywhere else in the United States and cause the life of human beings, Christians should not remain silent and confuse good for evil and evil for good. We may not always know what to do immediately when these terrible events happen, but as the Church of Jesus Christ, we can ask God to give us the courage to speak redeeming words into situations that carry the foul scent of racial injustice. We are filled with the Spirit, and we are filled with the words of life, Therefore, we must speak as witnesses to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Paul reminds us that we are children of the light. Therefore, we must begin to speak words of light into contexts that have been left in blight. In the church in America, 
If we cannot give light on the moral issues of our day, what therefore can justify the church's continued existence in America? If the lighthouse does not give light, what legitimate purpose does it serve? Paul says in verse 9 of our text, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. As lights in our culture, Christians must give clear signals in the midst of our nation. The light of the spirit within us compels us to pursue goodness, righteousness, and truth. If we continue to give mixed signals in our language, in our politics, in our religious silence on the critical moral matters of our time, we will soon be judged by the human traffic of the world as being an unreliable vehicle that is absent of the Holy Spirit and is, all, and is one that has taken a wrong turn on the highway of irrelevance. Our Lord said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. It is those born of the spirit that can truly speak wisdom during a time of conflict. They can speak spiritual words into chaos and conflict because they speak as the oracles of God. Yes, we appreciate Paul's instructions to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs in the latter part of our text. However, we dare not confine our singing to a worship service that is imprisoned between the four walls of a church building because we are filled with the Spirit that does not dwell in temples made with human hands. We carry our singing outside of the church building straight into the streets. We carry our singing down before the city hall. We carry our singing down before the school board. We carry our singing into the halls of Congress and sing on behalf of the widows that have no hope and sing on behalf of the children that are hooked on dope. Help me somebody. We sing on behalf of the young people that are trapped in the grips of poverty. And that is my time of telling me my time is up. Just right when I, amen anyhow. But we're going to keep singing anyhow. But we're not going to sing in a closed-in environment. If you hear somebody telling racist jokes, open your mouth and start singing. When you hear the attempt to twist and to distort the truth. Open your mouth and begin to sing. Let's sing a song about life. Let us not sing only about the protection of life while it is in the womb, but even when it is born and come out of the womb, let's keep on singing. There is power in singing. If you don't believe me, ask Paul and Silas. They were locked up in the prison cell because they dared to talk about the name of Jesus. But around midnight, the Bible says, they started singing and they started praying. And in the words of Elvis Presley, the jailhouse started to rock and the freedom doors swung open. We got to keep singing and keep praying, but we can't just confine it in the comfortable sanctuary of our churches. 
We got to get out there and get in the middle of the struggle and say things that may cost our reputation, that may cost us our resources, that may cost us our relationships. You got to sing on anyhow. Even when the music stops, you got to keep singing. Even when your backup singers shut their mouths and walk off the stage, help me somebody, you got to keep on singing. Sing for truth. Sing for justice. Sing for righteousness. Sing until a new song breaks out in the heart on that resurrection morning when all of God's children from every nation under heaven will be gathered around the throne and we'll sing and worship God in an environment where there will be no discrimination, no racial division, and no hatred. But until we get there, we got to deal with the realness of this world and begin to open our mouths and challenge the evil of racism and racial discrimination and even rage and bitterness and unforgiveness in the world where we live right now.